Welcome back to Kiko Mining Investment Trends. I'm Jeremy Safran. Well, Patriot Battery Metals is now in possession of what's being called the world's largest and highest grade pellucite hosted cesium pegmatite resource. That's a mineral that's nearly vanished from global markets, yet crucial for solar tech defense and imaging systems. But this is more than just one metal. Patriot's Quebec project is emerging as a multi-critical mineral system, of course, hosting lithium. This is a lithium story, but now also tantalum, gallium, and this high-value cesium. At a time when China and others are actively scouring the globe to secure these inputs, Patriot may be sitting on something far more strategic than previously priced in. And just a reminder, Volkswagen already took a 9.9% stake last year at a modest premium. And the question now is whether markets, governments, and strategic buyers understand what this asset could become. Joining me now is Ken Bridston. He's a CEO and Managing Director of Patriot Battery Metals. Uh, good to see you, Ken. Pleasure to be with you, Jeremy. Thanks. Let's talk about this latest news, my friend. I mean, uh, the numbers on this made is made in resource on CCM side are extraordinary. Over 30,000 tons, it grades north of 4%. Explain what those numbers actually mean for production potential and also value here. Yeah, the team, really, it's full credit to them. That's another amazing discovery at Shakajewanan, and it's really proven to be a key critical minerals host. When you're in the hard rock lithium world, you're working in these LCT pegmatites, lithium, cesium, and tantalum. And what's been found at Shakajewanan is now an abundance of each combination of scale and grade. And you quite rightly pointed out this new cesium discovery absolutely fits that category. In fact, it's likely the largest discovery. Um, and certainly in the last 30 or 40 years. So, yeah, really incredible and something that we're really keen to capitalise on as we continue to focus on the development of the Shakajuanan project. You know, it's interesting. I mean, I, I had you on last time. We were talking a little bit about CCM, trying to break it down to the audience and kind of what it is. It's not that well understood, but it is priced at over $2,500 US an ounce in metal form. Uh, just break down a little bit about you know where it's used and, and why that demand is rising right now. I just mentioned this race to critical minerals. I mean, very topical right now, Ken. Oh, so true. Yeah, the critical mineral story is crucial for the West. And it's equally true for cesium, another one of these specialty metals and definitely in the critical minerals category. Um, yeah, its uses, well, historically, predominantly as a heavy media in deep oil and gas drilling. But in the last 10 or 15 years, it's also very important in the optoelectrical industry. I appreciate that's also a mouthful. But basically what that means is it's making its way into um, applications where you're using and modifying light. So, it, you know, classic examples would be things like medical imaging, but now also photovoltaics. Um, of course, everybody is familiar with the classic solar panel, typically based on a silicon matrix. But what's happening in the development of solar, the solar industry is obviously everyone's looking for, for greater efficiency. That, that's a, you know, a key outcome. You could collect more sunlight and you could turn that into more power. And what's been found is that the application of cesium in what's called a perovskite structure or a perovskite module provides a really uh, um, enhanced efficiency in the average solar panel. And it's not small either, you know, sort of 30% efficiency gain, something like that. What that means is that the solar industry is intensely focused on how they can apply that technology. However, Everybody has been worried about the abundance of cesium, its ability to make its way into the supply chain. But also, like a lot of the critical minerals, China is definitely a dominant player in that supply chain. So clearly, if there's a big new discovery, there's potential to provide more cesium to global markets and make the most out of the, the solar industry's efficiency gains. So... Yeah, we're looking forward to more interaction with industry downstream and seeing if we can make that a key part of the plank for future development at Shakajewana in the cesium category. Nice. Uh, Ken, you know, we, we were talking about that global race for critical minerals, and obviously it's accelerating, and China's looking for, you know, we're talking about cesium right now, but also this gallium, tantalum. You've just defined, you know, all three down in Quebec. Are, are you hearing from buyers directly or indirectly already? We, yeah, we are, and we've already been, been receiving inquiry. Um, when we first announced the discovery of cesium, that, that started the first rounds of inquiry, and uh, we've been happy to continue to engage with the industry downstream since. Now, I think that 
equally. That's happened in cesium, but it's the same for tantalum, tantalum the key mineral being tantalite, but also spodumane producing the lithium. So Shakaduanan's uh, discovery and especially the predominance across the board in those key minerals, lithium, cesium, tantalum. I would also throw gallium in there, uh, albeit more work to be done in that area. They are absolutely crucial to the future of demand in the West and, and typically dominated through China's supply chains. That concentration risk does represent a challenge for industry, um, and that's why we will continue to receive uh, you know, interest and, for that matter, continue to engage with industry downstream about what the alternative supply chains might look like. Yeah, you know, to your point, I mean, there, some of these countries are almost treating strategic minerals and strategic metals like, you know, sovereign wealth funds, and they're starting to really invest. I mean, you know, we're seeing this with the Trump White House with that executive order. Do you believe Canada is sending a strong enough signal internationally that it's open for business when it comes to strategic minerals? Yeah, I think the response that's starting to come from Canada is heading in the right direction. Uh, and, and it's akin to, it's akin to what's happening elsewhere in the Western world. It's starting to tweak now just how important some of these new energy minerals are. And for that matter, uh, how far behind the West is. So, mm -hmm. so in Canada, what you have is you have, quite literally, you have the bain marie of critical minerals. It's kind of crazy, Jeremy, that you worry about going to Ukraine. Greenland or, or the Democratic Republic of Congo when across the border uh, Canada has these incredible resources and that's particularly true in Quebec and that's particularly true in our project. So what does it mean? Well, I think in the end uh, you'd have to say that logic prevails. There is key projects in the West and, and of course, we'd put our Shakajuana project in that category that are absolutely key to the growth of really material and multi-decade supply. That's what we represent. And that's ultimately the sort of project that we're, we're hoping to develop um, that supports industry for many, many decades to come, but at the right volume. And based on what we've discovered so far, what's identified in resource, we have an abundance of key critical minerals in the form of lithium, cesium and tantalum. Um, with an expectation that we can continue to grow the footprint into gallium over time and maybe even rubidium. So the combination of those things is a really powerful proposal for Western interests and, of course, across mm. the border in the US as well. Yeah, not to mention, I must say it, China must be watching this closely, Ken. Uh, okay, well, let's get back to lithium because obviously it's still the core here. Um, you know, this was found on your lithium deposit, the CV5, uh, over 100 million tons. I mean, can you kind of give us an update on this feasibility study? Uh, Q3 still on delivery target? Spot on, Jeremy. Yep, that's exactly right. So we'll be delivering the feasibility study over the coming months. And our objective is to define the, the first wave of project development, but also mm -hmm. scale. So, yeah, big lithium project, stage development, first 400,000 tonnes per annum of spodumene concentrate, second stage taking to a total of 800,000 tonnes per annum of spodumene concentrate. And what we achieve out of presentation in the feasibility study is the ability to progress the final phase of mine authorization. So it's a lithium-only feasibility study, mm -hmm. principally serving the purpose of the first round of mine authorizations. Our expectation is that we can continue to optimize the project, inclusive of the other co-products that, that we've talked about today, Jeremy, the cesium and the tantalum and maybe down the track the gallium and, and the rubidium. But they ultimately represent an opportunity to add further economics to the project and, and become, you know, ultimately to become a key supplier of the broader critical mineral suite. Um, but in the first instance, lithium, CV5, and yeah, it's a big one, approximately okay. 100 million tonnes, as you pointed out, uh, defining a mine life of nominally, you know, 20 years. So, so it's really material to, to the future of the lithium world, uh, North America, European supply bases. Yeah, yeah. Huge numbers here, Ken. I mean, really massive. Is there an opportunity to develop both in tandem here? Are you sequencing lithium first? I mean, there seems to be a good opportunity for cash flow. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's too true. So so our objective in, in um, ensuring the lithium development in the first in instance is to, is to have the effect of um, 
uh, let's say, broadly speaking, de-risking and simplifying the approvals process. But of course, from an economics point of view, it does make sense to take these co-products uh, as they become available, just bearing in mind they're in effect in the same ore body at CV5, uh, tantalum especially, and then over time, ensuring that we can bolt on CV13. But from a development cycle point of view, CV13, where the bulk of the cesium is, is a little bit further behind, but not too far. So our objective, continue to progress CV13 as fast as we practically can, whilst the development is underway at CV5. Yeah, well said. And I mean, now sitting on all of these, I mean, cesium, tantalum, gallium, uh, they're all listed on the global critical minerals list, yet your market cap still reflects a lithium kind of only story here. Uh, how's the retail audience? I mean, are they starting to understand what, what an opportunity this is? Yeah, there's a lot to soak in there too, isn't there? It's been a tough time in lithium markets, and I completely understand the, the um, you know the frustration, if you like, that, that uh, I can assure you we feel as well. But in the end, when you have a great project um, and now complemented by these other critical minerals, our view will be it's, it's one of the most important development projects in the lithium world because of not just its lithium, but the value in the co-products, the byproducts that exist within, you know, within effect the same ore body. Um, now, we're not going to be presenting that value in the first mm-hmm. round of the feasibility study. But our expectation is that the economics and the benefit that comes with those co-products will arise during the detailed engineering phase and we'll be bolting them into the future development cycle for the, the larger project. Yeah, and I'll tell you, I mean, we talked to some, some lithium plays out there, but I'll tell you one thing. N- no one has Volkswagen buying 9, 9.9% of Patriot at that modest premium. That's not a retail endorsement. It's strategic capital. We kind of understand their motive at the time, especially with the EV space, but do you believe they want more exposure? Yeah, I do, Jeremy. And they've made that pretty clear in our discussions with them. In the deal that we announced in, in the latter part of last year, closing early this year, um, it was a multifaceted deal. It considered the first round of offtake, albeit a small proportion of our total production, um, in respect of the equity investment. But it went, it went the next step and said, well, we are going to continue to keep financing a large lithium project, in which case we should keep open the door, um, for the access to capital and aligning that with more product or more offtake. Um, but then also one step further beyond, uh, basically a, a, an understanding that we're going to work together to continue to build the supply chain downstream. And in particular, where it suits that, that Western facing model that, that we talked about earlier for, for North American and European markets. So I think it's clear that VW and PowerCo have obviously taken a positive view in respect of our project. And you would too, Jeremy. It is one of the great ones globally. Um, and that, that ultimately it can deliver a lot more product. With that as a backdrop, we expect the relationship to continue to grow with VW and with PowerCo, and for that matter, others potentially that, that take the view that this is one of the more important projects globally. The consortium should grow to ensure this project's development um, and, and hopefully aligned with the growth that we see in North American and European markets through the balance of this decade. Yeah, well said, Ken. And I mean, you've been in this industry a long time. Uh, if this were a U.S. listed company with VW already in the cap table and these grades, you know, this wouldn't be trading at a substrategic evaluation here. Yeah. Look, Jeremy, it's a frustrating game. Um, equities for sure. But in the end, what you rely on is a great project and a great team. And I'm yeah. firmly of the view that we've got those characteristics here at Patriot and we're looking forward to, to what both what's possible with the project but also a bright future in, in the critical minerals world. Hey, Ken, on the district potential, I mean, you know, you've, you've defined the, the Regal and Vega zones at CV13, both still open at depth and a long strike. Is this system potentially bigger than what the market's modelling here? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, our expectation is that if we keep drilling, uh, we'll inevitably be turning up more resource and there's a reasonable chance that some of it will be high grade in each category, whether it's lithium, cesium or tantalum. I think we've proven that now. And the team has continued to work on the exploration potential across the whole package. Um, so far, we've drilled about, let's say, 
six and a half kilometres worth of strike extent, but the, the strike extent over our main package is about 20 kilometres, um, and we know there's other outcrops that are worthy of further, of further drill testing. And that's exactly what the team intends to do. We're not going to be drilling with quite the same intensity that we might have over the last couple of years, um, but we're definitely keen to tease out the, the further exploration potential in the project and yeah, look forward to demonstrating to the market just how good this geology is. Wow. So it could, you know, be the start of a kind of a district scale critical minerals hub in, in northern Quebec. That's too true, Jeremy. Yeah, I think in many respects, we're already there. It can only get bigger. All right. I got to ask you a final question, uh, because when we look towards, I mean, it's summer right now. I know you're you're on your way over to Australia. Talk to investors over there, too. What's your message right now to investors, you know, governments, even strategic buyers about the real value of what Patriot has discovered here? When you're building these critical mineral supply chains, you need a couple of key characteristics that are going to add value to, to developments downstream and accessibility of the product that you currently feel constrained about. And the first would be you need scale and grade. And we've got that in spades at Shabatuan and a multi-decade project that's now been proven in resource to host pretty incredible endowment of, of critical minerals. So the scale and the grade, that's important because that's what's ultimately going to help support the balance of the supply chain that's required. So you need the raw materials, you need it at scale and grade. But to realise the value in those specialty metals and critical minerals, you need the downstream processing capacity to make it real. That's where China invested so heavily in the last, let's say, 15 years especially, and now has a material lead over the West. So if we're going to get serious in the West about establishing independent supply chains, you need the right resource, scale and grade that's cost effective, and we'd suggest that's exactly what you get at Shabajawadan. And then you need to think about the investment downstream. Even better that you have projects that are going to be around for multiple decades to, to support those investments. Yeah, well said. All right, thanks for this, Ken. Uh, wishing you the best time in Australia. I hope it's great. Pleasure, Jeremy. Thanks for hosting. Always. All right, that's Ken Princeton. He's the CEO, Managing Director of Patriot Battery Metals. The company trades on the TSX under PMET or PMET, ASX under PMT and the OTC under PMETF. Now, for more on the global race for critical minerals, stay with us right here on Kiko Mining. I'm Jeremy Saffron. We'll see you next time.